Please welcome back to the stage the president of ACS, Judy Jordan. Good evening, everyone. I'm Judy Jordan, 2023 president of the American Chemical Society. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the ACS Spring 2023 lecture series sponsored by the Kavli Foundation. Reflecting the mission of the ACS, as well as that of the Kavli Foundation, this lecture series promotes groundbreaking discovery and public understanding of, the, of many of the world's challenges and how chemistry and chemists provide solutions. The ACS is grateful to the Kavli Foundation for enabling us to highlight the achievements of outstanding researchers in the chemical sciences. The Emerging Leader Series shines serious spotlight on the scientists younger than 40 years old who have made exceptional contributions to scientific or engineering research. This evening, I am pleased to introduce the Kavli Foundation Emerging Leader in Chemistry Lecturer, Professor Lydia Kisley the Warren E. Rupp Assistant Professor in the Departments of Physics and Chemistry at Case Western Reserve University. Born and raised in the Cleveland, Ohio area, Professor Kisley received her Bachelor of Science degree from Wittenberg University and was an NSF Graduate Research Fellow at Rice University under Professor Christy Landis, where she received her doctorate in chemistry in 2015. Her postdoctoral research with Professors Martin Grubula, Deborah Leckband, and Paul Braun at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign focused on protein folding in polymer environments and was supported by the inaugural Beckman-Brown Interdisciplinary Postdoctoral Fellowship. Professor Kisley joined CWRU in 2019, where she has since received an NSF Career Award, an NIH NIGMS Maximizing Investigators Research Award, was named an Allen Distinguished Investigator, and has been a nominee for the J. Bruce Jackson MD Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Mentoring. Professor Kisley's research team uses single molecule and super resolution microscopy to study new materials that can impact material design decisions in medicine and industry. Specifically, her lab is developing microscopy methods to image molecular diffusion in the extracellular matrix in chemical reactions that occur in corrosion, and nutrient movement within and surrounding cells. This evening, her lecture, Seeing the Molecular World of Materials, Single Molecule Microscopy at the Crossroads of Chemistry, will show that studying new materials with single molecule microscopy can impact the many subfields that interact with physical chemistry at the crossroads of chemistry, which it also happens, is the theme of the ACS Spring Meeting. Everyone, it's my honor to present Professor Lydia Kisley. Okay, thank you so much, and thanks for that very generous introduction and the opportunity to share my research with you today. And my goal with my talk today is, regardless what area of chemistry you come from, is to show you that single molecule microscopy is an amazing technique to view the world at the way we're trained to think about it as chemists. And I hope you leave with some ideas of thinking about how single molecule microscopy might be able to inform your own research and the different types of chemistry you may be doing. So before I get into the research and getting into the details of single molecule microscopy, I want to acknowledge uh, the people who do the research in my lab and produce all of those results. So I have a great team of researchers, and the projects I'll be talking about today include uh, work done by a great PhD researcher, Ricardo Manganeria, and also some work done by a former postdoc, Anuj Thaini. Without that, the team, I wouldn't be up here giving this talk. I also want to acknowledge and really thank the ACS Phys Division, particularly Christy Landis, Julie Bettine, David Terrell, Laura Garaudi, and Francesco Pisani for um, their support, and it's a great division. Uh, if you're trying to find your home in ACS Phys, I highly recommend it. I also want to thank the Kavli Foundation for the support of uh, this opportunity to share my research, all of the funding and projects discussed, and of course, giving a talk like this, I reflect upon 
all of the professors, mentors, colleagues, and friends uh, who have made chemistry a great place for me to work in the community to get that done so you guys know who you are. So with that, I guess, nostalgic reflection, I also want to bring you on uh, to reflect and think of nostalgically about how you became a chemist. I mean, we're all here at ACS. So uh, this is actually the classroom that I took general chemistry in. And if you can reflect back on, okay, when did you get really inspired and say chemistry is gonna be the thing that I do? Um, was it in gen chem? Was it in a different chemistry class? Maybe it was like, I'm a physical chemist and thinking about, I guess I'll use this screen over here on the right, thinking about the dynamics and thinking about the tools that you can develop to look at the molecular scale. Like here, a ligand in a binding pocket of a protein and being able to resolve the molecules and uh, their interactions at such, uh, with such detail and scales. Maybe it wasn't PCHEM, maybe you thought about, hey, I can think of any molecule and think of ways that I can push electrons around and break bonds or form bonds and uh, organic chemistry was uh, what really inspired you. Maybe carbon wasn't enough for you and thinking about in the middle of the periodic table, uh, thinking about how you can control uh, crystals and nanomaterials and being able to produce materials with exciting electronic or light emitting properties. Or maybe it was, I just wanted to be able to tell what molecules are present and develop new tools and techniques to be able to sense those material, those molecules at uh, in different environmental applications or health applications. So I'd say regardless of the area of chemistry uh, that you call home or what the type of chemistry that you do, something that unites all forms of chemistry is that we have this molecular perspective and molecules are really the way that we view the world overall. So we have this molecular view and this training and inspiration in our work, but when we're actually in the lab, how, what are we looking at and what are we observing with all these different types of samples? So from all these same papers, the type of data that you collect, that people collect or observe the world might be using, using light and spectroscopy. This is some Raman imaging data about uh, ligand and protein. Maybe you're using radio waves and magnetic fields and getting structural information with NMR. Maybe you're using smaller wavelengths in the X-ray range and getting structural information with crystals. Or maybe you're not using light, maybe you're using electrons directly to detect chemical reactions. So when we're observing the molecular world, many of the techniques, and when we're getting this data, this is published data that's really idealized, we, it still might be a challenge to understand what's going on at that molecular scale. We might have broader peaks. We, here you could see a shoulder. Over here, these asterisks are indicating uh, some contaminants in the sample, or maybe it's a little challenging to pick out the exact peaks and know exactly what it's assigned to. And why is it, sometimes a challenge to understand what's going on with our spectroscopic or electrochemical techniques. Well, some of those challenges arise because we're doing our measurements with our favorite unit as chemists, the mole. Maybe in the expo you saw Professor Mole or whatever the nickname is for that, or even in my uh, shelf at work, I have one of my favorite, uh, a little uh, souvenir from a past ACS meeting. And we work at this molar scale because, and the only reason that's like a SI unit that we use is because that's something that's tangible that we can work with our hands and we can measure out on a balance and the like. So when we're doing those measurements at this molar scale, we might get data that looks like this. Pick your favorite technique. Where if I got this from an instrument, I would see this and I would be like, oh, this is pretty nice data. It's a Gaussian peak. I have, I can uh, pick out the peak here and there's some broadening here because I'm not doing this at zero Kelvin. There's some thermal energy, but it looks like all my molecules are behaving the same way. But since I'm doing this measurement at the molar scale, in reality, this distribution here is actually four different populations where there's actually uh, very uh, similar behavior, but we can't resolve that because we're measuring an ensemble at a time. So this heterogeneity or variation in our sample is obscured when we're averaging over moles of molecules. You could even see this little orange peak here, this little blue peak here, that are rare behaviors contributing to this that we can't resolve when we're doing ensemble measurements. So um, this is a challenge with many techniques, but I'm here to say that we don't always have to measure at the ensemble level or at the molar level. We actually can visualize and detect individual molecules. So this is some data that I collected back in my PhD, but I never really get sick of looking at it. And even in my lab today, 
staring at single molecule data still amazes me because this is how we're trained to think as chemists. That what you're seeing here is these bright spots are individual molecules. So these are individual proteins tagged with fluorophores. And you can see the heterogeneity that's taking place or that variation in the sample. So these proteins are interacting at a surface. And what you can see in the background, you see a bunch of bright fluctuations. So those are proteins that are freely diffusing. You can also see this spot right here where there's a molecule that's stuck uh, and just stationary the whole time. You can also see a molecule come in here, adsorb and desorb at a single location. And then in the upper left, we can see a molecule come in, stick to the surface, hop on that surface, and move around. So there's just in this short looping video, there's already four different types of behavior in this small area. So it's extremely powerful to be able to visualize these individual molecules. And how we do that is using how I mentioned fluorescence. And how we can get down using fluorescence of the single molecule scale is um, a combination of things. One, we're using fluorescence, so that means I'm sending blue light to my molecule, exciting it electronically, it loses some energy, and then relaxes back down and emits a redder photon. So that, redder, that spectral difference allows us to detect just the emission from those molecules. Also by making sure we get many photons from the molecules allows us to detect individual uh, fluorescent molecules. So here this is a picture in my uh, optics lab that we're using lasers uh, to excite our molecules. We have very high quality optics as well, so a lot of those photons are getting to our molecules and then we're collecting a lot of those photons. And then once the photons reach our detector, there's a very high chance, 95% chance that photon will be converted into an electron and we can detect it on our computers then. So those were key aspects of being able to detect individual molecules, having the right components and using fluorescence. And we have this on an optical table, um, so we have a lot of control um, and we can build our own microscopes, but I also just wanna point out that there are commercial setups available and even ones that work in biohoods that this field is now at that level that you have your black box instruments, but it has those lasers inside overall. So why measure single molecules? I told you it looks, I think that data is really cool, but if you're not convinced, I, um, a key thing is that if we have our heterogeneous data, how can we resolve that heterogeneity? And that's where the single molecule detection comes in. That when we detect single molecules, what we're doing is we're counting each individual delta function that contributes to that population. And many times we're collecting millions or 10 million observations to build up that ensemble distribution. And when we measure one molecule at a time, we can then resolve those uh, rare behaviors and see how and why they're different for our sample. So that's one important reason uh, and one of the great powers of being able to do single molecule imaging. But there's further benefits as well, because not only can we get uh, resolved heterogeneity, we can also get information about at the nanoscale, because detecting single molecules allows us to beat the diffraction limit of light. So we're using visible light to look at our samples, and it's long been established since the 1800s that the, based on the wave properties of light, the best that you can focus that light is approximately half the wavelength times the numerical aperture, so some properties of the optics there. So Ernst Ambe, when he was developing Zeiss microscopy and polishing lenses and building new microscopes in the 1800s, defined this uh, diffraction limit. So what this means is that if we have multiple fluorophores, which we commonly do in samples, if they're separated by less than that diffraction limit, their emission patterns will overlap and we'll get blurred out data somewhat. But the power of being able to detect individual molecules means that we don't necessarily have to define um, or image or define that molecule's location based on that whole emission pattern. That here you can see a 3D image of the intensity of that emission from an individual molecule. And we don't have to define that whole pattern. In the same way with a mountain that we don't necessarily have to define it by the whole base, we define it by the summit. What we can do is fit and localize the center location of that molecule. And uh, if we do this repeatedly, so let's say here in this cartoon, we have some structures in the cell, these are microtubules, let's say, and we label them with fluorophores. If we can isolate individual molecules, say where the center of those molecules are, that's what those black crosshairs are, and then repeat this over and over again with different subsets of individual molecules, we can get nice, uh, we can get higher resolution data. So this allows us to get resolutions at the order of tens of nanometers instead of hundreds of nanometers. People have even demonstrated single nanometer resolution with uh, um, a lot of data. And we go from these blurry diffraction limited image to a super resolved image here. 
So this capability of using single molecules and being able to localize them to produce these super resolution images beating the diffraction limit of light is why the technique won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2014, especially for all the information that it's provided about the structural arrangement inside biological environments. So single molecules allow us to get these beautiful nanoscale structural information, but we can also get dynamic information if we're looking at things over time, going back to this video, that we can track individual molecules and their displacement over time to get diffusion information. We can also look at uh, the time scale of a molecule absorbing or desorbing or time scale of chemical reactions if we're reporting them with single fluorophores. If we put fluorescent dyes on different areas of a biomolecule, we can get conformational information. We can do this as a function of temperature and pressure with polarization counting things, there's so much dynamic information that we can get at the single molecule scale, resolving all the heterogeneity in these dynamics. So with all of that power of single molecule and super resolution technique, techniques, um, this is a very broad field um, and many amazing scientists uh, contributing to it. And I'll say that where you'll see the most single molecule and super resolution data, I would say is mostly in uh, cellular biophysics where you can get beautiful structural information, this work from Zhao Wei Zhang's group in Tizhou, looking at the structure of axon filaments along the axon of the neuron that allows uh, our nerves to be an entire meter long and maintain its structure. Um, also, there's, I would say it's used in nanoscience, looking at uh, dynamics and nanoparticles here, showing a catalytic reaction on the surface of a nanoparticle, getting the kinetics, getting where active sites are on these nanomaterials and imaging nanomaterials themselves. So of course, there's many other areas people have looked at, not just looking at eukaryotic cells, dynamics in bacterial cells, dynamics of polymers, looking at nanoparticles. So I stand on the shoulders of giants of all the people in this field who not only de developed the technologies, but have looked at so many samples. But what my lab does in the realm of single molecule and super resolution imaging is thinking, okay, outside of the cell and nanomaterials, what other areas of chemistry at this crossroads of chemistry uh, and what other materials haven't been studied with this single molecule technique? Because I would say it's still viewed by some fields as a somewhat specialized method. So our idea is we'd like to have some impact on areas of medicine and industry and uh, what new materials can we study at this scale? So my group is organized, I would say, in two different areas, one in the realm of biophysics where we're saying, what if we take this technique and look just outside the cell in the extracellular matrix? So this environment is a very heterogeneous, both structurally, chemically, it's at the nanoscale of a mixture of proteins, uh, glycoproteins, sugars, soluble proteins. And from the perspective of an individual protein, how does it interact with that environment, especially when cells can also modify that environment, exerting forces, excreting new proteins and modifying that? Can we see how the dynamics of proteins change in that environment? Um, so I unfortunately won't have time to, to talk about that today, but um, just a plug that a uh, postdoc researcher in my group, Stephanie Kramer, will be talking about this work tomorrow afternoon if you'd like to hear about that. Also in the realm of biophysics, we're developing new techniques, taking ideas from super resolution imaging and connecting them with mass spectrometry in collaboration with Laura Sanchez at UC Santa Cruz where we're looking at uh, detecting nutrients outside the cell and in the cell at new resolutions. The second area of my group is more in the materials field, where we're looking at corrosion at the single molecule scale. Can we detect corrosion right when it starts, understand spatial relationships between where those reactions are taking place? And then finally, also looking at separation materials. Um, and can we understand liquid separations and design and understand where these separations are failing from the bottom up and inspire the design of new separation materials? So I wish I had time to talk about all of it, but I'm mostly gonna focus on uh, the separation project. And if we have time, I'll talk about corrosion overall. So when I bring up separations, I mentioned it's going to be uh, liquid separations. And depending on the type of chemistry you do, this might mean different things. So if you're synthesizing some molecules and you're separating your products, maybe you're just running some gravity columns over some porous silica. Maybe you're working with HPLC systems where you need something more under higher pressure to get the separation and detect the analytes that are there. Or even at the industrial scale, separations play a huge role in the pharmaceutical industry and oil and gas industry that um, reports, there's estimates that 10 to 15% of the energy use in the United States is related to separations. So if we want 
a more energy efficient future if we want, uh, more efficient processes, understanding separations is a great place uh, to study. So those are the different views of separations and chromatography, but if I posed to this audience here, if chromatography is your favorite technique, I know, I think I've had two yeses only, but everybody else usually says no. And why is chromatography not our favorite technique? Well, one, if you're making some molecules, you would love to ignore thermodynamics to get 100% yield, but unfortunately we can't do that. Or if you're developing a method, uh, you would love to have the ultimate resolution that you can resolve whatever you want or detect whatever you want. But we can't do that, thermodynamics does exist. So we have to do chromatography, but it still wouldn't be people's favorite technique because one, it takes a ton of time. Um, when I was an undergrad and we did the separation chromatography labs, it was like, okay, I have to wait here 20 minutes. That's not very fun. Um, it's even longer with gravity columns. Even if you can do a more high efficient separation with HPLC, well, when you get your column and you have a new molecule you wanna separate, well, it's gonna take a lot of time to develop that new method. That if you order a column, the material that I'll be talking about, it actually comes with this flow chart of, okay, here's what you should start with. If it's not working, go back, change the mobile phase, change the pressure until you can get this to work. There's not much understanding of why uh, to, or how to get that um, without doing that trial and error. And I'll also do another callback. When you took analytical chemistry, uh, there was this concept when you did the separation chapter about the theoretical plates and the number of theoretical plates. And I don't know about you, when that got brought up, I'm like, what are these theoretical plates? It's like, well, they're not real. Uh, it's an idea from distillation theory, and we have this equivalent number of plates in this column, but it's very phenomenological and it's not really physical. Um, and that was developed in the 1940s, and that's still what we're using today to just quantify the performance of our separations, and it's not very connected to something physical. So uh, I think there's room for improving separations and our understanding from that physical perspective. And the National Academies recognizes this as well in the, their 2019 report. They recognize that we need to have this molecular understanding and also taking ideas from different fields to improve separations overall. So that's the perspective that I'm coming from, uh, that I'd like to use single molecule microscopy to improve chromatography. Because going back to how we currently look at separations and the quality of those separations, We'll get our elution profiles, our peaks that I was showing earlier, where here a common problem is fronting or tailing. And with this type of peak, you can't really resolve why the fronting or tailing is taking place. Also, these elution profiles are very removed from what's physically happening in the column, where we'll have diffusion and mass transfer between the mobile phase and the stationary phase, where we'll absorption and desorption and diffusion along the surface within the particles we'll have diffusion, intraparticle diffusion with those porous stationary phases. And then within a packed column, we'll have diffusion between those particles or interparticle diffusion. So I'll be showing you that with single molecule imaging, I've already shown you that we can look at adsorption and desorption, but also we're working on, we've developed microscopy so we can actually access intraparticle diffusion and interparticle diffusion. So I'll tell you about how we achieve that and also the findings that we've been making about the structure of the stationary phase. So with that single molecule imaging, we'll be able to uh, build up those elution profiles from these molecular observables in these types of materials. So with that, we'll be able to build up from the bottom up an understanding of chromatography that all these observables that we have at the single molecule scale relate to what analytical chemists and also industrial separations um, and relate to. So we'll be able to access that heterogeneity, identify those issues, and then the goals in my research group are to look at new types of challenging separations that haven't been studied at this single molecule scale. So this includes chiral separations where the analytes are identical except they're mirror images of one another. And then also with some collaborations, we're also looking at rare earth separations. Um, and also we want to make a connection to the real separations and the materials being used in columns. Because so far in the field, um, I would say um, most studies, of chromatography at the single molecule scale have been looking at model samples. Because to do fluorescence images, we can't just throw a column on our microscope. Uh, this is metal, light wouldn't interact. This is the sample holder on a microscope of a glass cover slip here, where we need our objective uh, in contact with that, we can flow analytes over the top. 
So I'd say the small but mighty community of looking at chromatography at the single molecule scale has mostly been looking at model samples where you can see the names of the scientists here um, that uh, people have looked at reverse phase chromatography where we take a cover slip and you functionalize it with some silane so you have a C18 surface to mimic that. Or for ion exchange chromatography, we spin cast a thin film of agarose over the top or so to mimic that so it's compatible with our microscope. But this is very different than the actual stationary phases that are used in columns. You can imagine dissolving a polymer, spin casting it, that's gonna change the properties compared to what's actually in a stationary phase particle. So I do wanna acknowledge there's been, I think, three papers where people have looked at actual stationary phase materials. This is from Joel Harris's group at Utah where they were able to do tracking within one of the uh, reverse phase particles, but it was just in one focal plane. They got diffusion information, but they had to infer everything else in 3D with modeling. So we'll, um, what I'm gonna talk about is being able to get that three-dimensional information, and the ideas we've taken from biophysics of this highly inclined and laminated optical sheet microscopy so we can actually resolve single molecules uh, in these stationary phases, and then I'll walk you through how we achieve that and then cool images that we got and how those images are informing uh, some next directions in the function of these stationary phase particles. So to start off with what our sample is, is actual materials from columns. Um, Regis was very generous in being, sharing some chiral stationary phase particles with us that they use in their reflect columns. Uh, so these particles are five microns in diameter. They're silica as the base, and the silica has 100 nanometer uh, pores, nominal pore size. They modify the, these silica particles with a cellulose coating, and then they uh, functionalize it with this tris molecule uh, to have some chiral selectivity. What our analyte's going to be uh, in our imaging is this rhodamine 6G molecule. It's a fluorophore, has very high quantum yield, and that's our model analyte, and it interacts with these particles. So we place these on our microscope. I'll show you a diagram of the sample later on. But our microscope schematic is shown here where our sample is placed here. This is kind of like 90 degrees over. I won't walk you through the whole setup here, but I want to point out two things. With our excitation, we can control the position of the excitation laser with this uh, lens on a translation stage. And that moves the laser so it can pass through the center of objective or at a high angle through here. And we also have our objective on a nano positioner, so we can scan through our sample in 50 nanometer steps. So if we flip our objective here 90 degrees and we get a view, how paths work looking at uh, samples um, uh, or stationary phases were done in a more traditional epifluorescent mode. So that means you pass the laser through the center of your objective. So when you do that, you focus at your focal plane, you can collect data there, but there's a lot of excitation of molecules that are not in focus, and this increases your background. So this is why we're using the high-low technique, where if we move that lens on the translation stage so the laser is at it not passing through the center, it's passing off the center, well, the lens is gonna focus that light at a high angle. So we'll have an effective light sheet passing through our sample. So we put our sample on top where you can see our stationary phase particles that we immobilize on a glass cover slip. We uh, have the light sheet pass through there and we flow in our analyte R6G in a buffered solution. And when it interacts with those particles, we can see fluorescence from it. While molecules that are out of focus, we won't receive any signal from them. So looking at how HILO looks versus epifluorescence on our microscope, you can see some data here where these are individual stationary phase particles in the epifluorescence, and then also you can see some grouped together packed. Uh, you can see that the molecules interacting, we can resolve some single molecules, but if we change it to that high low geometry, you can immediately see and qualitatively see the improvement in our contrast here in our signal to background ratio, and we can see those molecules interacting. So we did quantify the performance of this, looking at individual frames here, we localized molecules, and saw an improvement in the signal to background ratio as we varied that angle, that high-low angle, and made it sharper and sharper, or uh, higher and higher here. And we have a peak performance at uh, 76 degrees, 76 plus or minus three degrees, which agrees with what was achieved in uh, cellular imaging as well. And then we also looked at the number of mo molecules we localized per particle per frame. 
And we see a different difference in performance if it's grouped or isolated particles, and this relates to the accessibility of the dyes to those particles that I'll highlight a little bit later. So we can resolve single molecules in these stationary phase particles, and then we can take those ideas uh, from super resolution imaging that we can take our raw data, we can uh, not just describe and find molecules with their entire emission pattern, but find that center location, that summit location. So here the blue stars are indicating where the center location of individual molecules are, and then we can plot all those localizations, and we can renormalize this, so this is a diffraction limited image here. So this is if you just did traditional imaging, compared to if we did that super resolution localization, we get this nice picture of where that molecule is interacting. So we can look at this improvement, seeing that when we do super resolution, if we zoom in, we can resolve individual binding sites, um, while the diffraction limited image, we wouldn't be able to resolve that. If we take a line section across the particle, we see with the diffraction limited image, it looks like molecules are interacting everywhere compared to the super resolution that we're seeing areas where there's voids where molecules aren't interacting. So all this data is in 2D, uh, but we can also do this in 3D with the uh, objective positioner that I mentioned, that we can do a Z-scan and taking algorithms that are actually developed for um, MRI and 3D brain scans, we took that same code and could reconstruct a 3D super resolution map of where molecules are absorbing. Where here I just changed the color scale here from this purple to green compared to the heat map before. So with this data, we can inspect the dynamics uh, of those individual analyte molecules within our stationary phase in more detail. We can see that if we look at each Z stack here and look on the micron scale, how many molecules are interacting, it's the same throughout the particle. So there's not a preference of the top or the bottom or the middle. And we can also look at the kinetics. So looking at the absorption times, this is a cumulative distribution of the probability of finding a molecule absorbed for a certain amount of time or longer. And we see it's the same throughout the particle in Z. So if we look at this average over a micron area, it's all the same. But when we look at individual binding sites, so one of these bright green spots compared to a purple site, we do see there's variation at the nanoscale from site to site in the kinetics uh, overall. And we can also inspect that heterogeneity between particles as well. So here you can see these two particles have uh, similar type of heat maps compared to we see some stationary phase particles are not as, uh, I would say, functional or have as high of an affinity that we're not seeing as many molecules interact with this one over here. So uh, this is kind of at the particle to particle level, but the exciting stuff that we've been pursuing is that when we've been looking at these cellulose modified uh, chiral stationary phase particles, what we've been seeing is that even though they're quoted and sold as fully porous particles, what we've been seeing with these small R6G, anal rhodamine 6G analytes is only interactions around the edges of the particle. And especially, for packed particles, the particles in the center have no molecules being able to access them. And if we take the same particles that just haven't been functionalized with cellulose, so these are five micron silica particles with 100 nanometer pores, we can see the dyes can access everywhere. And very clearly in the um, packed particles that uh, particles in the center can still retain those molecules overall. So what this is telling us that there's limited pore accessibility despite being a fully porous structure and that these particles are actually acting more as, I would say, they're sometimes called core shell particles or superficially porous particles where they actually make stationary phases where it's solid in the center and then porous around the edge. But here, just modifying these particles with a polymer is suggesting that you get that behavior uh, without having that solid core. Because we have some preliminary data just from last week where we started to, where we dissolved the polymer coating and also tried varying pressure and it's looking like those polymer coatings are, uh, is what's leading to the difference between the silica versus the cellulose overall. So this is, we've been having conversations with Regis, they've been um, uh, generous to let us keep working with these materials, um, but it's giving us some new insight into the function of the stationary phase at the single molecule scale. So I think with this story, hopefully you can see that taking ideas um, from the biophysics single molecule community, applying it to new material questions with chiral stationary phases, we can look at the materials that are used in columns and get new information about those function of those materials overall. So I wanna shift gears now and talk about 
the other material project that we have in the research group and looking at corrosion at the single molecule scale. And corrosion is a huge problem. Uh, it influences many aspects of our life um, from infrastructure to our drinking water safety um, to safety in the environment with oil and gas pipelines. And it's even inspired some artists as well. Um, I'm sorry that the name got cut off here, um, but this artist out in uh, Pennsylvania uh, goes and takes these beautiful images of rust isn't just a problem, it can also be an inspiration as well. Um, but my interest in corrosion relates to this figure that I think we all have seen when we take chemistry for the first time and you get to the lecture chemistry chapter. So here you can see iron zero undergoing corrosion, where at this anodic site you have the electrochemical re redox reaction where you have iron two and two electrons. So they say at the anodic site, iron two dissolves in solution, the electrons that are produced diffuse some distance away and react somewhere else at the cathodic site. So my question when I look at this figure is, how far away is the anode and the cathode? Where are those electrons going? And depending who I talk to, I get very different answers. When I talk to the physicists in my department, they say something, oh, it's probably like angstroms, like those electrons will find a hole or react with something very quickly. When I talk to the chemists, they usually say nanometers or maybe up to a micron. We have scanning electrochemical techniques that are suggesting that, that say like, that's probably the scale that's happening. And then if you talk to the corrosion engineers, they say, oh, I measured currents miles down my pipeline. So we have orders of magnitude difference here. And this is, corrosion's been studied for many years, but I, if you have the answer, please let me know. Um, you'll save me some time, but to my understanding and looking through the literature and talking to people, there's not an answer there. And why haven't we had an answer to that question? Well, if we think about the ways that we study corrosion, in the realm of electrochemistry, oftentimes it's studied with cyclic voltammetry techniques. So when you take a piece of iron, you're gonna apply a voltage to that and you're gonna say, I really want you to corrode and I want these electrons to go to this, ele uh, these electrons to go to an electrode I have sitting in there and you're saying, come on reaction, happen. Um, so that's not really under native conditions. Also, in some of the models for corrosion, um, this beta factor here is um, a value of 0 0.5 and what it indicates is that the electron and the metal ion are treated completely symmetrically overall. And when I look at an electron versus an iron uh, ion, like the masses are completely different here. Should they really be treated symmetrically? You can do imaging to understand corrosion, but at the nanoscale, this is traditionally done with electron microscopy methods. So you can get these beautiful nanoscale images the problem being that you're doing this under vacuum and you also have to do an ex situ. So if you wanna look at changes over time, it's gonna be a very uh, time intensive process. And then I'll say from the engineering perspective of looking at corrosion, um, a lot of methods are just, let's stick it outside and wait for a while or put it under some artificial accelerating conditions and they'll look at different material formulations and look at the loss of metal at millimeters per year. That's the length and time scale that they're looking at much different than uh, the nanoscale questions that we have here. So what I'd like to do, what we're aiming to do is can we visualize corrosion? Can we do it under native like conditions? Can we do it right when it starts and get at the mechanism of corrosion when it's starting? And can we do it at the relevant length and time scales to be able to access that? And I hope and I think that single molecule imaging would be able to do this because that measurement or that scale that engineers work at is millimeters per year. And if we just do simple dimensional analysis, we get down to nanometers per minute. So that means single reaction should take place on the order of seconds. Um, and we've been taking um, ideas and tools, again, developed from biophysics and developed from the nanocatalysis community of being able to detect um, redox reactions using fluorescence with fluorophores that go from a dark state to a bright state and applying those to corrosive environments. Um, and uh, that's been done at the single molecule scale in biophysics and catalysis, but in corrosion, fluorescence imaging has been um, more done at micro scales or even macro scales. Um, that fluorescence has been used. So for example, here, this is an iron three plus sensing dye and it's embedded in an epoxy film. And um, you can see that it turns on over the course of 40 hours with a scale bar here of half a millimeter. Also in this group here, this is an iron surface where they were using a pH sensitive dye where you can see that in these pits, they were able to sense fluorescence there, but again, with a scale bar of 40 microns. 
And why hasn't, uh, I guess with these longer time scales or this is under applied voltage, why hasn't it gotten down to the single molecule scale? And the past work using fluorescence and corrosion wasn't using the, the great uh, optics. So they were using um, low numerical aperture objectives, quant low quantum efficiency detectors compared to what we're using at the single molecule scale. And just looking at the ratio, we should get two orders of magnitude better um, return on the photons that we collect. And this isn't even considering that these projects were using lamps and we're gonna be using lasers. So if we can just get enough photons, can we get down to that single molecule scale? Um, is what we pursued first. So we started with this textbook material of looking at iron corrosion, and we identified fluorophores that would become fluorescent upon reacting with these products. So on the cathodic half of the reaction, we used resazurin that turns onto resorufin. This has been used extensively in the nanocatalysis community. And we introduced in the presence of an iron colloid. And you can see even at the macro scale, we can see the color change uh, over 24 hours compared to a control with no iron. We could do this in the bulk and look at the increase in fluorescence over time, look at the kinetics of this, of looking at the total increase in fluorescence versus time for different um, salt concentrations where salt will break down any passivation layers um, to speed up that reaction. So in the bulk, we could say resazurin can be used as a reporter um, and we can extract some kinetics. On the anodic half of the reaction, we took some fluorophores that have been used to sense iron two plus in cellular biophysics. So um, we studied two different fluorophores. This one, the Fe2 plus reacts with this oxygen here. So then you shift the electron distribution so this turns on and becomes fluorescent. Or this flows in three, um, chelates with the iron two plus. So there's two different mechanisms for that dye turn on. And when we did this in the bulk, we saw increases overall in the total fluorescence intensity. So this bulk characterization said we do have fluorophores that turn on in response to corrosion. So then we took it over to our microscope and did imaging um, in the presence of our iron colloids. And you can see here at the same time scales that we were doing those bulk experiments with resazurin, we can see an increase in the number of fluorophores that we sensed. And we know that these are single molecules because over the course of a single movie, we could see characteristic single step photo blinking and photo bleaching, and that tells us it's an individual molecule as opposed to multiple molecules. We switched this out, so we did the imaging uh, with our iron two plus sensing dyes um, with the same type of colloids. And you can see we also see these single step photo bleaching that these dyes can be sensed at the single molecule scale. And the past work was just limited by the optics that they've been using. So um, our next steps uh, are to start to do some super resolution mapping. This is some very preliminary data on metal surfaces. So our past work here was working with colloids which was limited where we could observe um, the dyes couldn't interact with the base of the particle there, and also uh, we wouldn't be able, we weren't able to uh, resolve images throughout the particles here. So we've moved to metal films, and here you can see on a steel surface that we're seeing an increase in activity in this pit um, that we're seeing. We're also seeing difference in dynamics of the different pits, so we're very excited about where this is heading. We have some great scientists joining us in the summer to help contribute to this project as well. Um, and I'm hoping that the next time I talk to you, I can answer that question of how, where is the anode and where is the cathode? So this is my dream picture of a super resolution image that let's say we have an iron surface here. These are the anode sensing guides and the cathode sensing guides. Let's say we get a super resolution map of those pit locations. Will we see the electrons diffuse very far, be at the same location, or maybe just go nanoscale distances? We'll see um, with our future work. Um, and I also didn't have enough time uh, to talk about that. Another benefit of using fluorescence to look at corrosion is you can look at reactions where you have a non-conducting environment. Using electrochemistry to detect corrosion limits you to uh, solvents where electrons can travel through, uh, so mostly aqueous solvents, but we have some also some very exciting work of looking in non-aqueous solvents, so corrosion in organic solvents, and we're doing collaborations with industry to look at uh, corrosion with lubricants as well. Uh, and looking at um, uh, lubricants that are used in electric vehicles. So we're excited about that uh, potential impact with industry with this project overall. So with that, I want to wrap things up, but I hope uh, I've convinced you single molecule microscopy is a pretty cool tool to look at different types of materials. Um, it can have a very large impact, and it already has, of looking at 
inside the cell and also biological and biomaterials. Um, again, go to Stephanie's talk tomorrow at 2.30, I think in room 241, if you wanna hear about the biophysics projects. But in our studies of materials, we've expanded the types of uh, chemistry uh, that uh, we've looked at, looking at chiral separations and also looking at corrosion at the single molecule scale. So I know I'm coming from the perspective as a physical chemist, but hopefully whatever division you're in, hopefully you see that there's some connections here of biomaterials, medicine, analytical chemistry, uh, colloid science and polymers. There's so much intersection um, with chemistry that uh, at this crossroads can intersect with the tools that we develop in physical chemistry. So with that, um, thank you so much for your time, attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Let me just get the electronics set up here. So let me ask you again. Thank you, please, Professor Kisley, not only for today's lecture, but also for your countless devotion to your students, your science, and to ACS. And you gotta love the promotion of a postdoc's talk, everybody. So thank you very much. So with that, please, okay, don't be annoyed by this, but I can't see a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, it's there you right go. Here, yeah. It's really, it's interesting. So please don't think I'm uh, ignoring you. Please. If you have any questions, please bring yourself up to the uh, microphones. We have times for questions, and also we're gonna get some questions hopefully online, and I've got a little device here that I can ask you those questions as well. So please bring your way up to the uh, microphone if you have a question. When you get up to the microphone, please identify yourself, your name, your institution, or where you're from, and then by all means, please ask your question, please. Are the mics on? Um, AV team, how you doing back there? Don't see any. Oh, there you go, you got it. Uh, I'm Jim Lee, I'm from UT El Paso. Nice talk, thank you. Uh, my question is you do single molecule microscopy. Mm -hmm. So how do you ensure it's, um, what you are detecting is at the single molecule level? Yeah, so when I was talking about the corrosion project, you saw those intensity traces versus time. And where you see those single drops in intensity and turning back on, that has to do with the photophysics of the molecule. And that they'll sometimes turn off and turn back on. That's called photoblinking. So the fact that we see a single drop and then a single increase back on, uh, that's indicating to us that's an individual molecule because the probability for multiple molecules to undergo those transitions at the same time is very low. So that's one way that we confirm that it's an individual molecule. Um, and okay. to also to achieve that, we work at really low concentrations, so picomolar and nanomolar concentrations. All right, thank you then. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Zachary Bashkin. I'm from the Aspiring Scholars Directed Research Program in Fremont, California. And I had a question. Um, did you think that this um, technology might have applications in designing new heterogeneous catalysts for organic synthesis? Yeah, and I would say there's, go to the ca catalyst division as well. There's many people working on that and being able to understand uh, the spatial relationships between, I guess, the structural and chemical information of the heterogeneous solid support and the reactions they could drive. So um, uh, I guess the image I showed was from Peng Chen's group and many people have come from his lab and um, there's uh, many people, so I would direct you to that community. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, In the back there with the cap on, please. Hi, I'm Joshua Fuque Painter. I'm a student at St. Martin's University in Olympia, Washington. I had a curiosity about your, uh, about the applications in corrosion. Um, I remember you mentioned that there is, sorry. <coughs> Ow, I should not clear my throat in front of a microphone. That is a bad idea. <coughs> Are you
Are you okay to continue? Should we move on to no. another question and then I'll come back no, to I'm you? Okay. I'm okay. Okay, then go ahead. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the, so I remember you, you know, said that there are wide variances in the size of the corrosion systems, like uh, you were talking about you know, little you know, plates that would be uh, microns distance between the anode and cathode yes. uh, uh, versus you had heard some engineers talking about miles difference mm -hmm. along a pipe. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's any correlation between the distance between the anode and cathode and the general size of the metal involved? Yeah, so that's what we want. That's what I'm hoping to come back uh, uh, and that's what we're hoping to find. Um, our observation volume, or our observation field of view right now, we're using a wide field technique so we can image a large area, I would say hundreds of microns um, at the same time. So we can at least probe uh, distances simultaneously at that length scale. We can also scan over our area. So this is all on the microscope. Um, so I would say we're working with samples that are maybe um, a couple of centimeters large. But if we want to go to longer scale distances, that would take an advancement of bringing some type of tool into the field, um, which would be, I would say, future aspirational work overall. All right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Good. The first person in the back, my left. Hi. Uh, <coughs> my name is Xiao Yushi, an assistant professor from UC Irvine. Um, my question, uh, uh, I have two questions. The first one is about the single molecule detection on the B surface. Um, so what's the KRF, or in other words, the binding duration when single molecule binds? Um, and uh, also like the second question about that, uh, associated to that is if you're using a fluorogenic dye, which means when binding, yeah. the signal to noise ratio is more than 10 times higher, yeah. would you be able to increase the throughput or yeah. concentration? Those are great questions and like a true assistant professor, you have two. Uh, so I'll try to address both of them. So first uh, question, the KD. So the KDs that we're getting right now, are, I would say are in the order of hundreds of milliseconds um, overall. And we do controls with laser power to make sure it's not because of bleaching or damaging the dyes. Um, so those, but we do see some rare events that last on the order of seconds. So back on the slide where I showed individual sites, we see a single exponential. So the behavior at single sites is traditionally just a, a first order kinetics there. But when we look at the particle overall, we see the multiple components because of the variation between those sites. And some of those rare behaviors get on the order of seconds. And I really like your idea about the fluorogenic dye. So just like with the corrosion where we have some type of turn on, that yes, that could definitely increase our throughput if we wanted to just look at adsorption. Um, we also have interest in looking at diffusion within the particle. So if it was fluorogenic, uh, I think, that would be a little bit more challenging, but maybe that'd be a great way if we want to tell the difference between diffusion and then also adsorption between those two, because that's something that's a challenge with our analysis. So I like that idea. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I've got an online question here from Stephen Ferber. As a chiral spectroscopist, is there any visual evidence of the enantiomers? That is, do you have any idea whether we are at the level of actually seeing the difference between the chiral molecules? Yeah, so that's where we're headed next. So the boring thing with the molecule I talked about here is it's achiral. Um, but uh, Ricardo's collecting data, again, uh, just the past couple of weeks where we have a, a left-handed and right-handed peptide that have a fluorescent label on that. So that's definitely where we're headed. And mm -hmm. of course, like a separation of just one molecule isn't really a separation. So we want to have multiple molecules and yeah. see how the competition is between those different handed molecules. So that's where we're headed. That's very interesting. Person in the front, please. Hello, I'm Pierre Fogarty from High Point University, and I was wondering, you're studying a lot of things in really crowded environments, which can sometimes cause interesting spectral properties and whatnot, and I was interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great point, and that's also what connects some of our biophysics research in the extracellular matrix and the separations. That's a very confined, and we can have crowding that's present there. So I would say we haven't seen uh, effects on the spectral properties of the dyes quite yet, um, but that's also, for the extracellular matrix project, we have a protein that uh, is a crowding sensor and changes, it has a, if you're familiar with FRET, you have two different colored labels, they transfer energy and you'll see changes in the green versus red light. 
So we're using that to measure also the local confinement in addition to the dynamics that are taking place. Thank you. Chris in the front here. Uh, I'm Chen Bing uh, from UT Austin. Uh, I have a question about the phase separation. Uh, for the excited uh, particles, uh, those photons, when they emit from the, especially inside of the particle, so I'm wondering how can they escape from, you know, those, those photons can, can they escape from the, the inside of the structure and then can be taken. Uh, yeah, so can we detect the, why aren't the photons being influenced by the yeah, by interior the of the particle? Yeah, so, um, that was something we were concerned about. We also worked with refractive index matching materials or solution or solvent, and we didn't see a difference between when we were using that refractive index matching material and uh, the aqueous solution that we were using. Um, and based on, I guess, the size of the pores and the amount of solvent that's in those uh, particles, we don't think we're having uh, issues with resolving the locations of the molecules in there. Thank you. Christian in the back. Hello, so my name is Joe. I'm an undergraduate at Monmouth College in Illinois. And my question was related to your findings with single molecule microscopy. Do you know if iron corrosion occurs at a constant rate? Yeah, so what we're seeing is that uh, with our bulk studies, we saw first order kinetics uh, with that rate. So, um, but what we're very interested in is that's in the bulk when we're looking at the single molecule scale where we can see different locations where corrosion is taking place. Some of our preliminary data is seeing that certain locations we're seeing an increase in the amount of corrosion that's taking place and then also other areas will turn on and turn off in the amount of corrosion. And there's been work in the nanocatalysis community where they've shown that there's communication between sites where redox reactions are taking place and we're wondering if something similar is happening in corrosion. Because my view is that um, catalysis, those redox reactions are desired redox reactions. Corrosion is just an undesired redox reaction. But are there similarities between those, uh, the phenomena that are taking place there? So that's what we're interested in looking at. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take our last two questions from the two people on the, on the okay. right side. Mike Lodish, per Purdue University. Um, you mentioned being able to distinguish uh, diffusive transport within stationary phase particles. Um, high efficiency chromatography now is looking at very high convective flow rates, including flow rates within uh, through pores in these particles. Mm -hmm. My question is, do you have the temporal resolution to distinguish the uh, transition between diffusive and convective transport? Now, th it's a very practical question because it really defines how quickly chromatography can be done at a given resolution. Yeah, so I would say with, if you're trying to do single molecule localization, our resolutions of tracking diffusion is on the order of, um, I would say, uh, one to 10 micrometers squared per second. Uh, we're getting better cameras that have microsecond frame rates and also if you start to use correlation methods instead of localization, you can get to faster uh, diffusion as well. That if you go to Stephanie's talk, you'll hear about our limits that, and how we're trying to push that maybe up to 100 micrometers squared per second. But um, that's something that if you're at Purdue, I'm guessing uh, you have a great analytical community there and stuff that we want to talk more with the separation scientists to uh, get an idea of what those scales are and how we can study things that you're interested in. So I'd be happy to talk more. Thank, Thank you, you very much, and also a very nice lecture. I really appreciated it. Okay. Thank you. And our last question, please, wrap her up. Luis Ortiz from University of Michigan. Uh, Resalsorin dyes are widely used for cell viability studies uh, because of the redox reaction, and you can determine the cell viability based on that. But it's well known that you have to be careful when you use those dyes in cell viability because local changes in the environment polarity, pH changes, uh, one may, makes the resistorin dye not accurate for the yeah. determination of cell viability. And you are doing something similar where you're going from the off state to the on state. How do you account for changes in local environment? When you're yeah, that's a changes? very true point. Um, we have to consider like uh, some of these dyes at low pH, then they won't be fluorescent anymore. So you have to do, yeah, of course, proper controls. Um, and um, that's also why we've kind of taken a shotgun approach of we've purchased many dyes and we see which ones where we see activity and we see agreement between 
uh, the ensemble and just the single molecule scale and also confirming our results with non-fluorescent techniques. Because I was surprised I didn't get the question that I would say the major limitation with this type of single molecule technique is you have to have a fluorescent reporter. Um, so that's the one drawback that that can influence your environment. Um, you're also getting an indirect or a secondary readout of what's taking place. So that's always an important thing to consider with doing this type of microscopy. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, please join me in another and final round of applause for a great lecture. And thank you so much. And congratulations.